Hello everybody, I'm Simon Selmak, the research assistant from the Innovation Center of Faculty of Mechanical Engineering, University of Belgrade, and I'm here on behalf of my colleagues to present a paper titled Elastic Plastic Behavior of Welded Joints During Loading and Unloading of Pressure Vessels. Approximately 40 years ago, a test stop was built as a part of the reversible hydropower plant in Baina Pasha, and it required an innovative design which resulted in the need for extensive experimental research regarding its structural integrity. This was caused by the fact that the penstock was to be made from a... that there was the need to make a single penstock instead of two, which in turn required a stronger, higher quality steel. And for that reason, the high strength low alloy steel, Summit and 80 was selected, since there was a requirement for steel with the yield strength of about 700 megapascals, and in this case, Sumitan has about, well above 800 megapascals, so it was determined to be the material. However, this caused another, certain other problems, especially with the plate thickness, since, it, since the highest plate thickness in fabrication was about was 47 millimeters, and the plate thickness in this case was supposed to be above that, so that was an additional reason to do this research regarding the structural integrity. Thus, two full-scale prototypes of the pen stocks were made so that the data about its integrity can be gathered. There were two types of load that were, that were used. The first specimen, the prototype was tested in static loading and unloading sequence, while the second one was subjected to impact loading or explosion. In this paper, we will only deal with the static loading and unloading sequences. With this test, it was possible to evaluate the significance of present cracks as well as its fitness for purpose assessment. For this purpose, a finite element method analysis was, was performed by making a numerical simulation in the Abacus software. Now here, we can see the full-scale full model of the pen stock, which consisted of two plates that were that were welded together under an angle of 5 degrees, which was also important in the later calculations and made them significantly more complicated. So here we can see the, the locations of the strain gauges and all of the me measuring locations. And here we can also see the longitudinal and circumferential well welded joints in the whole pencil. Of particular interest was the part in the in the upper right here, which represents the longitudinal submerged arc welded joint, which where some a bit of unusual behavior was reported. So here, this is the part where we were focused especially on strain gauge 34, which will, I will speak of a bit later. So here we have the chemical compositions of the materials used: the sumit and ATP, the bare material, and the weld and the weld metal. I forgot to mention there were two different types of welded joints. In, in this case, the submerged arc weld and the manual arc weld. And in, of, in our case, of, the submerged arc weld was, well, was of particular importance because this is where the plasticity and the unusual behavior had occurred. And here we can see the mechanical properties of the materials that were used. And from this, we can see that the weld metal had a somewhat lower yield strength but that the ultimate tensile stresses were almost equal. These are the experimental results from, from 40 years ago, and here we can see how the load sequence was carried out. There were two stages, the first load and the second load stage, and each of the stages was also followed by unloading. Initially, the pen stock would be loaded up to the value of 90.2 bar, which corresponded to the working pressure. Then it would be held at a slightly lower value for some time before being unloaded. The, fo the following second stage involved the loading of the pen stock to a value of 120.6 bars, which also corresponded to a hoof stress of around 533 megapascals, and then unloading again. Now if you look at this picture, you will see that one of these diagrams is not like the others. So here we have a very unusual shape of the curve, and that is what inspired this whole work and why we started experimenting with it and making numerical simulations. 
because it turned out that with the pressure load that was applied to the penstock, the parent metal would deform elastically, but the weld metal would go into plasticity and would remain deformed. However, once the load was removed, the parent metal would go back to its initial state and would also force the weld metal back into its position, even though it already had some plasticity. Thus, the unusual shape of the curve and the so-called plastic unloading. So, the finite element model was created in Abacus and the numerical simulation was performed. The model was made with the 5 degrees angle and was fixed on its top and bottom sides, sides with the pressure, inner pressure applied as the load. Now, of the results we have. We had results for really presented for both the first loading and the second loading stages, including the unloading parts of these steps. So the results will include Mises stresses, Mises stress strain curves, stress pressure curves, pressure strain curves, and hoop stress strain curves, among others. Also, it should be mentioned that there were two versions of the calculations, one with the residual stresses and one without them. So first, let's see the results without the residual stress. This is the model as a whole, and this is when it was subjected to the internal pressure of 14.5 megapascals during the first loading. Here, we can see that the highest stress values are obtained around the middle, circumferentially. This is also the location of the 5 degree, ang five degree angle, and is also the reason why the stresses are significantly higher there. Now, at this stress value of 721 megapascals, plasticity again occurred in the welded metal, but not in the heat affected zone or the parent metal. And we can see it here, where we have plastic strain. So there is somewhat very small plastic strain in this area, which also corresponds to the position of the strain H34 in the real experiment. We can see that there is no plastic strain in the surrounding parent metal or in the heat affected zones, which are represented by these two lines. <coughs> now we have the results for the stress distribution after the second loading, where the, the pressure used was 18.5 megapascals. And now we can see that the stress has greatly increased. And also, not, not only in the, well, the, in the welded joint, but also in the surrounding area. Actually, the value in the well, the joint itself is now lower because it has already gone into plasticity and can no longer accept the load. And again, we have a very similar distribution with the plastic strain, which of course is concentrated in the, in the same area, and this time it is a bit higher than previously. Now we have the diagrams, the stress strain curves and the stress pressure curves for the first and second loading in for the case without the residual stresses. Here we can, the red lines denote the first loading and the blue lines denote the second loading in all of the figures. So we can see that we have linear behavior initially and then another linear part which represents the part where the, well, the joint entry plasticity and then here we also have the unloading part. So if you look here at this picture, we can see that it looks a bit unusual, the stress pressure curve because of this is due to the residual stresses that we have previously ignored. So residual stresses are important to take into account for many reasons, one of them being so you don't have to explain what this is. So here we can see, also see the inner pressure versus the Mises strain diagram. And we can see that for the first law, again, we have some linear curve. And here we can see a slight change towards the maximum value of pressure. So, for the first load, the yielding occurred at 13.34 megapascals, which is equivalent to 531.5 megapascals of hoop stress, which is this value here. And here, we have a yielding in the second load of four, for the value of 14.8 megapascals, which is five, over 586.1 megapascals of hoop stress. Now, the second part of the simulation included the making of a model which would take into account residual stresses which were adopted as about 40% of the yield strength of the weld material, weld metal. So now we have the stress distribution here, which you can see that the stress concentration also occurs in the circumferential weld, but you can see the values 
are very similar to what we obtained in the model without the residual stresses. However, the load that was applied is significantly lower than that, as expected. So now we also have a very similar distribution of plastic of equivalent plastic strain. This is of course for the first load and the, after the unload stage. But here you can see that while it does look very similar, it is about an order of magnitude higher than in the case without residual stresses. So we can see that that can affect the results greatly. Now we have the stress distribution during the second load loading, this time for a pressure of 14.4 megapascals. And here we can see that the values are significantly greater than those that were obtained in the case without residual stresses at the approximately same load. And again, the highest values are obtained here in the welded, in the welded joint area, the one corresponding to the strain gauge 34. Now we can, all, we can also see the plastic strain in the, in the second loading and loading story of this for once again the same pressure. So again the result shows significant concentration of plastic strain in the area where, the, where it was expected and where it was obtained during the experiment. Now we also have the diagrams for these cases which have also shown some interesting results. This one, the stress strain curve, was somewhat similar. Of course, you can see it's, it doesn't start from zero because now we have taken residual stresses into account. But still, it does remain somewhat linear for both the first load and the second loading as well. Now, for the hoop stress strain curve, we have a bit of a difference than the previous case because in this case, there was no plastic strain in the circumferential direction, but only in the direction normal to it. And this is why we have this pointy curve that does not have a part with the plasticity can be seen. So, in conclusion, and based on the results presented in this paper, we can, we can say the following. The heat affected zone that I have mentioned previously of the micro allen steel has greater resistance to the cracks than the weld metal, and we have seen that there was actually no plastic strain in it, which is a bit unusual for, for such type of joints. So, when st stable crack growth occurs, in this case it will occur at very high stress levels due to high yield strengths and high ultimate tensile stress of the used materials, and thus the welded this welded structure depends on from the hydropower plant <coughs> can operate even in the presence of large surface cracks. This, as I said, the integrity of a welded joint is not affected by the presence of surface cracks since due to overmatching the, the plastic any plastic strain that is present in the weld metal where it will appear before will result in a fracture in the parent metal which of course will only happen at very high values of stress because of the selected material. So thank you for your attention.